students and colleagues, I'm absolutely delighted to welcome you this evening to our inaugural ambition lectures. We will listen to the first lecture, um, the first two lectures, sorry, and then break for some refreshments, followed by our final speaker. There will then be a further opportunity for us to socialise and enjoy the refreshments at the close of the speeches. If anyone needs to use bathroom, the facilities are just through the double doors there. So the ambition lectures. This concept has been bubbling away in my mind for the past couple of years as a great way to engage with you all at an academic level beyond day level and to allow my brilliant colleagues to demonstrate to you their passion and their intellectual curiosity in their specialist subject areas. I'm so delighted that in collaboration with the marketing and events team we're now here at the first of what we hope will be many of these events becoming a staple in the rich and diverse academic and cultural experience of the St. Joseph's College community. This evening, we will hear from Dr. Simpson, Dr. Rice, and Mr. Briffer. And without further ado, it is my very great pleasure to hand over to Dr. Simpson for the very first Ambition Lecture. Usually, when people go on first, they're the warm up act. So, <laughs> prepare to be warmed up. I can spend a bit of time on, so I don't want time to finish. So, if you haven't met me before, I'm an economist. Um, I studied economics for a far too long at university, and now I teach A level economics, and I dabble in some politics, uh, teaching as well, and some other things. But today, it's all about economics. That's my sort of first love. So, um, I'm going to indulge completely, not only in economics, but in my favourite bit of economics. Um, and today is mostly going to be about behavioural economics. But to uh, let you understand a little bit more about economics and where it comes from, I need to tell you that it's a very, very young subject. The youngest, really, that we offer just about. Economics didn't exist before Adam Smith wrote The Wealth of Nations back in 1776. Now, that might seem a long time ago, but if you're comparing it with history or maths or science, it's pretty young. Um, and back in the day, there were not so many people talking about this stuff. Um, so Adam Smith is known as the father of economics. He set it all out, and really, everything that we do now in economics almost references his early work. It's, it's sort of criticising him, saying what's good, saying what's bad, saying whether it works, testing assumptions and so on. Now, when he wrote The Wealth of Nations, the title gives it away a little bit, he was thinking about why some countries were more prosperous than others. Um, and he built into that all sorts of different things relating to um, self-interest and motivation and really was building up to this big argument that free markets were amazing um, and they were what caused countries to be prosperous. Um, and built into that was an idea um, which links very closely to behavioural economics and the stuff that goes along with that. So he had this idea of homo economicus. Homo economicus means economic man or woman. Um, and Homo economicus was this huge um, sort of assumption that was made about how humans work. And it, it really was based on this idea of rationality. So when consumers go and make choices, they're trying to maximize their utility. Utility in economics means satisfaction, wantability, happiness. So if you're going to the shop and doing your weekly shop, you might know how much you want to spend. It's going to be too much at the moment because my weekly shop is going up and up and up. So when you're going around and making your shop, you think, I've really got to make this um, work. I've got to get the best value out of my shopping. And the assumption is, if, if you're working with Homo economicus and you're a rational man, is that you are weighing up every decision very, very carefully and thinking, if I buy this and, um, and make this choice out of the other options that are available, um, is it giving me the maximum utility in all of my spending? Um, and you can imagine, this is quite a weighty, um, you know, sort of assumption that you make about how everything works. And, it's, and the assumption led to lots of economists using it in models about predicting about how people would behave. So, um, that's the sort of premise of the way it goes. And he said that choice gives you freedom. Um, he was very much about being free and, you know, including free markets and so on, and everybody having their own choice. And he promoted choice as being, you know, king. It would give us, and the more choice we have, um, he said, the better things would be. Now, I agreed with him um, in 
but I do agree with you in many respects. Um, and if I remember back to my younger years, um, when I was in my late teens, just at university, um, I went on a skiing holiday to Bulgaria. And when I was there, one of my friends had an accident, couldn't ski from day two onwards. So we used to take it in turns to go out for the day with him doing something that wasn't skiing, take a day off skiing. And we went to a local town out of the touristy bit. And this was not that long after the Berlin Wall had fallen, and it was still very much the sort of post-communist era. And we went into the local department store, and it was just barren. And there was really no choice whatsoever. And it just looked depressing, and not somewhere I would want to shop. Um, sometimes we might you know, grumble about the lack of choice in Aldi or Little. This was on a different scale, but it was you know, nothing to choose from. So when I teach economics um, to my a students, we have to learn a topic that's called uh, that's about efficiency. And we learn that there are different types of efficiency. When I say efficiency to you, you would normally think of it as productive efficiency, just trying to produce things very low cost. Um, but allocative efficiency means where you maximize the utility of society. And in working along Adam Smith's ideas and thinking about utility, you would think that by having lots of choice, people will feel very good because they will get to choose a product that's very close to what they desire. So the chocolate bars up there to remind me that I have chocolate here. Um, imagine if I was introducing a new communist state of Ipswich. I might say, well, we're going to think it's going to have a lot of central planning and it's going to be very difficult. So I might just have one chocolate bar to make it simple that you can buy in the town of Ipswich. And I will choose perhaps the, you know, the standard dairy milk chocolate bar and a lot of you, I'm sure, would be very happy to eat the standard dairy milk chocolate bar. But if you were going to the shop and you were buying a chocolate bar for yourself, how many of you would actually choose this chocolate bar to choose? What's your favourite or something? Who's, who has this as their favourite? No one has this as their favourite. I don't understand who buys it. Um, but actually, if I do have a square of this chocolate, I think that's pretty good. Now, if I, if I had that as a standard bar of chocolate, all of your utility would be worse because it's further away from your preference. Um, you might go, I'll go with crunchy. Who would choose a crunchy? So a few of you have crunchy fans, crunchy ice creams in particular, absolutely the best. So if I, if I introduce an extra choice and suddenly we have crunchy bars as well, some of my crunchy fans would now feel their utility is higher. And if I added double decker, any double decker fans? Yeah, I mean, it's underrated, the double decker. It's really good <laughs> chocolate bar. Um, and the curly burly, it's like just embracing your inner child. And only 98 calories. So that one's really good. So suddenly, if I have a choice, choice of four chocolate bars, you can tell that people are happier around the, around the room because now they can go, so go in and choose their favourite chocolate bar and their utility is high. So it seems like choice is good, right? I think so. The government thinks so. They're pushing choice everywhere. Um, uh, and competition and so on. Competition is a slightly different um, element, but we get, we'll get to that. So basically, we love choice. If you look now in the shops compared to even you know, when we were young or parents were young, um, product choice is now enormous. It's huge. Um, and if you can't get it in the store, you can get it online. And there's so many different products that we can choose. But the government's also pushing choice. They want us to have school choice. They want us to have patient choice where we can choose where we are treated. They want us to have choice in our energy providers. They want choice in everything. Um, so it seems like we've all got quite choice mad. When we go to the shop now, when we choose a product, we are left in an overwhelming state. If you want to go in and buy some oil, the array of oil is just phenomenal. Do you want it infused with a bit of chili or a bit of garlic or a bit of this, that and the other? Do you want um, virgin olive oil or extra virgin olive oil or extra, extra fancy pants on it? I don't know. I just want oil. Um, it's too confusing and sometimes this can lead to some fatigue in our decision making. And you could argue that maybe we have too much choice. So there was a very famous, um, well, actually, my psychologist, really, but I came as him as an um, economist, but really, he's not. Um, Herbert Simon, in 1955, did a really, really groundbreaking piece of work. And he was actually awarded the Nobel Prize for this work, looking at behavioral science. And he said um, that actually, when you look at the way people make decisions, there's too much cognitive load on them. They cannot stand there in front of those olive oils and go, right, 
I'm going to do a calculation and work out exactly which one's going to maximise me for my utility when I look at all the product characteristics and I think about you know, everything that is part of that decision making. And people get tired. If you did that choice for every single item you put in your trolley when you go around, around um, Asda, you would be there far too long and you would be very tired and angry at the end of it. So actually, we don't, we don't make choices like that. And so suddenly, the original economics assumptions were turned on their head and people said, maybe we aren't rational. Maybe there's a problem in the way that we make our decisions and we've been predicting behaviour based on an incorrect assumption. So actually, he said, we tend to utility satisfice rather than utility maximise. It's kind of we go along and go, oh, well, that'll do. That, and that's sort of how we make our decisions a lot of the time. Now, Herbert Simon's work basically said um, that we were making our predictions incorrect. And it was only really a problem because the economists wanted to say how much we were going to buy or predict what our choices were in a particular way. Um, he didn't really care much, or the economists working at the time didn't really care much beyond that. Um, but then it entered, much more recently, a whole stream of extra behavioural economists. And um, one that I'm going to focus on, Barry Schwartz, wrote a book called The Paradox of Choice. This was written in 2004. And he looked at it much more from the consumer's point of view about whether choice was good for the consumer. We've always assumed it is. They might choose in slightly different ways, but we've always gone, we like, we like choice. Um, and that assumption has sort of, um, you know, existed for a very long time. You can see that if you look at the end part, you have to read it all. More freedom and autonomy um, in the American system has happened, but we don't seem to be benefiting from it psychologically. He said that choice was not doing um, a lot of good for the consumers. It was stressing us out, making us feel bad. And he talked about a whole series of different reasons as to why choice isn't good and why choice should be limited. I am currently deciding where to go on holiday, where well, I have been for quite a while. So I keep going online, I keep going on lots of different travel agents' websites. I keep thinking I want to go somewhere Spanish speaking to encourage my year eight daughter that she needs to do Spanish long term. Um, so I'm looking at all these different Spanish places and then I'm thinking about the weather conditions because half my family are ginger, so I've got to think about too hot, not too hot. Um, and I have I've got all these things in my mind of what I've got to do, and then I've got to think about the price factor, and then I've got to think about the rooming, or whether we have separate rooms, or do, oh, there's so much choice. And actually, I've been thinking about it for months, and I haven't made a choice yet. Um, in the end, I gave up a bit, and I said, well, we're not going to have a beach holiday this summer, but we're actually going to be renting a house near my sister up north, and I've delayed my summer holiday to October half term, because it gives me longer to decide. Um, so I'm suffering from choice paralysis. It means I can't make a decision because there's too much choice and there's too many factors that are making me um, you know, question whether I'm going to make the right decision. And that choice paralysis links to a few other factors as well. Um, the next one I've got here is the responsibility of choice. So um, the government has encouraged us, uh, not just the current government, government, successive governments have encouraged us to have more patient choice so that we can decide where we want our treatment or whether we want treatment or all sorts of different things relating to you know, what we might or might not want to do. Um, so when you go to a doctor for some procedures, they will say, here's the pros and cons of doing this, and here's the pros and cons of doing that. What do you want to do? Um, and it's difficult as a patient because you think really the doctor's the expert. They've had years and years of medical training Maybe you just want them to tell you what to do. Just tell me what's best for you. If, if, I'm, if you were me, what would you do? Um, it's a little bit like us teachers sometimes do the same thing with students doing their A-level options or their, when they go and do their GCSE options. They will say, well, what should I do for my GCSEs? And we'll go, well, there's all these great combinations and these things go well and this can give you a future, but really, ultimately, it's your decision. You have to decide and be happy with it. And sometimes they really just want us to say, you should do this. And the same thing happens later in life with university choices and all sorts of other things. Sometimes they don't really know, and making the decision is really tough, but we put the choice onto the person to make, and we think that's really good. And mostly it is, but sometimes 
the responsibility of making those choices makes us as a consumer really, really, really stressed. So sometimes we might want to not have the responsibility, and that's something that um, um, was written in the book. This one's um, one of my favourite arguments that he makes. Um, when I met my husband, I met him on the terraces of Colchester United, and I was introduced from a, by a friend to him. Um, and that was a chance meeting because of a certain friends that I was in. And back in the day before online dating, um, that was how it worked. The number of people you would meet would be relatively limited. You might be fake people, but friends of friends, or people in the workplace, or people you might study with, and you look around and go, they'll do. Um, don't tell us that. Um, it was more than that, honestly. Um, that was my life. Um, however, it was a bit limited. Whereas, um, you know, when, when you met someone you liked, you're like, oh, right, this is the one. And then you, you know, you carry on and it was all great and you live happily ever after. However, um, now we've got online dating, it's slightly different. Because now, your pool of people that you can choose from is enormous. So we're, you know, you swipe left and you swipe right. If you swipe, I don't know which way swiping bad is. Does anybody know this? I don't know. Um, whichever way you swipe to say no, you can tell I've never done online dating, um, is, um, you know, you know there's thousands of other people on that app or, or uh, you know, competing apps that could get you the, the love match that you want. And even if you swipe the way that says you want to date, when you go on the date with a person, you might still be going, there could be someone better, there's loads of people on that app. Have I chosen the one? Can I actually get serious with this person? Because there's so many other people I could choose. And they think it's an actual serious problem. And it's to do with this concept of buyer's remorse. It's a bit like me and my holiday. If I buy the holiday, I'm going to find out about another one I should have gone on. You know, it's, it, there's, there's, I'm bound not to be making the right choice. I've done this exactly with my mortgage. Um, and, you know, actually, lots of us would be having to remortgage when you come off the trauma of the interest rates and all. Um, and you've got an absolutely crazy amount of choices on whether you want to pay a fee up front or whether you want to fix for two years, three years, five years, however much. And it's really, really traumatic as a choice because you think, if I make the wrong choice, I'm going to be upset that I've lost out and I've made a mistake. So you might just, you know, I don't know, it's just, it's, for this situation, you just might not make a choice and just keep dating forever. It's, it's, you know, perpetually trying to find the one, the perfect person. So when I was um, looking for a mortgage, um, or if I'm looking for insurance, or if I'm looking for lots of different things now, the market is now providing me with a solution. So enter into the room, um, all these, what they call in the, in the, in the industry, the confuse.com and the, the money supermarket and the compare the market.com, these are called aggregators within, within the industry, as my husband tells me he works in insurance. Um, and I just think they're comparison website, but apparently aggregator is the term. Um, and what you do is there, you put in your criteria of what you want, and then it gives you the answer. Um, you know, this is what you want, and it will select the best choice <coughs> for you. It's limiting the options that you have to choose from. And you can feel secure that you're not going to end up being ripped off and have buyer's remorse because you know it's compared the market and you know it looked at everything. Or you might have a local instead of an online one. I've shoved a nice link switch one in there. I don't know if anyone has any links with them. I, I don't. My only link is I've used them. Is that Bluebell Mortgages, for example, is a broker in it switch, and you can go to them and say, just I know I'm an economist and I should know, but just sort out my life for me. This is what I want go and you know, um, uh, tell me what I should be doing, and then I might do a cursory look at what they offer and compare it with Google for about 10 minutes and go, it looks fairly okay. Um, I might not be being ripped off. I'll go with it. Reduce the stress. So all of these things are sort of solutions to the very sort of horrid situation of what too, too much choice can do in causing us stress. And I know we've got a few marketing people in the room, this is a massive story for marketing departments. There's enormous choice. Lots of markets are saturated. So what markets are trying, what marketing departments are trying to do, is give you a perceived smaller choice because they want to stand out on the market so much that you don't notice the other choices that are available when you just go straight for them. So in terms of the application of all these concerns about choice, um, there is um, lots of opportunity to, to make a buck at these. Interestingly, a few years ago, a big story hit the um, headline about Tesco's 
So um, some companies like Tesco's, I think, partly cost-related, because it costs a lot of money to have lots of choice and lots of different product lines, but partly, um, perhaps driven by a very savvy marketing department that knows that maybe choice is overwhelming and that Aldi and Lidl are doing well with far less choice, they cut their product lines. So you can see there, I think it's 2015, the date on that one, probably, um, they cut their product lines from, at the start, 90,000 different items they were stocking in Tesco's. An overwhelming amount of choice. So even the big you know, product ranges that um, big retailers are offering are now being cut down, perhaps um, because of our you know, paralysis and our, our choice making. I think actually, we just, we just don't need that choice. If I'm shopping at Tesco's now, I go into my favorites online and just go, yeah, more of the same. So I miss out half, I don't feel the same. Um, one final word, really, is to think, um, a word of advice from the consumer point of view, given what we know the psychologists and the economists say about choice. If we're worrying about GCSE options, or A-level options, or university options, or mortgage decisions, or where to go on holiday in October half term, I think we need to give ourselves a little bit of a break. Um, it is overwhelming, the choice. And it's possible that when you make a choice, there could have been a better option. That's possible. Economists would say, you might still be maximizing your utility, even if you make the choice quickly and easily in a way which doesn't look like it's the utility maximizing choice, because there's a cost to the search. The hours I've spent online looking for the best holiday is time consuming and frustrating. And actually, if I make a quick choice and go, that will do, it will save me lots of stress. And if the holiday is marginally less fantastic than it could have been, I don't care, because I'm on a beach with some sangria somewhere, having a great time. And I don't really care what the other beach is like. So my advice to you is, sometimes, even though this is an ambition lecture, and we're saying aim high, I would say sometimes it's okay to give yourself a break and just go, I'm satisfied, and I don't care.